What on earth are dialectics? Today we'll be looking at socialism, utopian and scientific, a short work written by Frederick Engels. And in addition to the question, what are dialectics? We'll also be trying to understand the difference between the dialectics of the ancient Greeks and the dialectics of Frederick Hegel. We'll try to understand what are some of the problems with respect to the dialectics of Hegel. And we'll also try and understand what Engels meant when he said that philosophy is coming to an end, when he said that modern materialism no longer requires the assistance of that sort of philosophy which Queen like pretended to rule the remaining mob of sciences. And last but certainly not least, why is Hegel's philosophy even important to socialism? After all, we have socialist strands that do not entertain Hegel at any level. We have analytic Marxism. Uh, we have the structural Marxism of Louis Althusser. Why is Hegel even relevant with respect to socialism today? Well, Hegel himself considered dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. He thought that all ancient Greeks were essentially dialecticians. Panta rea, said Heraclitus, which means everything changes. Aristotle was considered one of the most encyclopedic minds amongst the ancient Greeks. He was a dialectician. And Hegel, similarly, was considered arguably the most encyclopedic mind of his time. Continental philosophy, that in the 16th, 17th, and even 18th century, was considered very much inspired by Hegel and by dialectics. People like Descartes and Spinoza and Denis Diderot and others. Whereas the English rationalists were much more focused on other methods and especially empiricist methods of looking at the world. Now, whenever we first observe something, whenever we reflect on something, our first observations and our first reflections are always largely holistic. When we think about nature, when we think about history, when we think about philosophy or the history of philosophy, at first we see an endless entanglement of relations and reactions, permutations and combinations in which everything moves and changes. We do not see the individual parts. We look at the picture as a whole. We observe the movements, transitions, connections, rather than the things that move, combine and are connected. In other words, we think, see things holistically. We do not see the details. We do not see the individual parts. But as we observe more carefully, we begin to see the details. We begin to understand these details. We detach them from their natural and special causes and effects. We detach them from the processes and we try to understand the individual parts that make up the entire mechanism or make up the entire process. It is much the same when humanity looked upon itself. For, for instance, humanity had to first collect all the materials for the sciences really to work upon, for us to really think about nature. The foundations of exact natural sciences were first worked out by the Greeks of the Alexandrian period and later on in the Middle Ages by the Arabs. Real natural science dates from the second half of the 15th century and thence onwards it had advanced with constantly increasing rapidity because all that material had to be put together somewhere in order for people to try and understand how these things fit together. In the last 400 years, Engels writes, humanity has made gigantic strides. In the analysis of nature into individual parts, the grouping of the different natural processes and objects in definite classes, the study of the internal anatomy of organized bodies in their manifold forms. These were the fundamental conditions of the gigantic strides in our knowledge of nature that have been made during the last 400 years. But the way in which we examine things in the past has left us with a legacy. It has left us with a habit of observing natural objects and processes in isolation apart from their connection with the vast whole, not in their holistic manner, but as, by as little, little individual mechanisms. We want to observe them in repose, not in motion. We want to observe them in constraints, not as essentially variables, in their death, not in their life. We want to observe them as being stationary. We want to make them stationary in order to observe them, but that is not how they actually exist. Bacon and Locke, arguably, are the philosophers, Engels writes, who are most responsible for this metaphysical, philosophical approach. Now, what does Engels mean by the 
term metaphysical, he means stationary philosophical approach. To hold everything down, not to observe things in their motion, but to observe things as out of motion, without their motion, and in their individual parts. Engels writes, Yea, yea, nay, nay, for whosoever is more than these cometh of evil. In other words, we want to put things into two different categories, yes or no, and anything that changes from one category to another or is comes in between these two categories is something that we don't want to think about, we don't really want to even observe. By we, Engels means, of course, people who follow Bacon and people who follow John Locke. In this manner of metaphysical thinking, things and ideas are isolated, are to be considered one after the other and apart from each other. They are objects of investigation, fixed, rigid, given once for all. And in this manner of thinking, we think about things as absolutely irre irreconcilable antithesis. A thing cannot be at the same time itself and something else, positive and negative, absolutely exclude one another, cause and effect stand in rigid antithesis to one another. You may have heard the term binaries, that we must undo the binaries. Well, this is exactly what Engels here is talking about, that metaphysical thinking always puts things into two rigid binaries that never interpenetrate, never change from one to the other, never uh, synthesize with each other. Now, there are great drawbacks of metaphysical thinking. There are obviously certain advantages as well. To be able to think in terms of isolating things helps us to isolate those individual things that are in motion. But it is insufficient to stop at that particular point in time. To understand things individually is very important uh, to begin with. But then you have to also see how they fit together, how they come together. And that is where metaphysical thinking neglects the connection between individual things. In contemplating of their existence, it forgets the beginning and end of that existence, of their repose. It forgets their motion. It cannot see the woods for the trees. In fact, in the real world, no definite binary boundaries exist. It is just as impossible to determine absolutely the moment of death, for example. For physiology proves that death is not an instantaneous momentary phenomena, but a very protracted process. Every organized being is every moment the same and not the same. How can one say that? That sounds almost insane, but think about it. When a person dies, not all the organs of the body stop operating at the same instant. The heart may stop at an earlier instance, but your um, nails will continue to grow, your hair will continue to grow. You may still be conscious for a few moments after your heart stops beating because your brain may not stop functioning immediately after your heart stops beating or, or vice versa. So Engels writes, every moment it assimilates matter supplied from without and gets rid of other matter. Every moment some cells of its body die while others build themselves anew in a longer or shorter time. The matter of its body is completely renewed and is replaced by other molecules of matter. So that every organized being is always itself and yet something other than itself. What a fascinating idea. But it is so true. Consider, for example, that the cells that I am made up of today, I was not made up of these identical cells 10, 20 years ago, perhaps even as little as three years ago. The blood in everything in my body, the blood in my body, the cells in my body, my muscle fibers, everything is in motion, in continuous motion. I eat food, it gets assimilated into my body, I, whatever is toxic and waste from my body gets expelled from my body and over time, although I'm the same Temur, I am not made of the same atoms and molecules and cells. In fact, those cells, those atoms and molecules are now part of other things in nature and here I am still Taimur. This is such a fascinating idea. I can be the same Taimur without really being the same Taimur. This is insane, but it's the reality of the way the world works. And that's what Engels means when he says two poles of an antithesis mutually interpenetrate. Positive and negative are, he says, inseparable. Cause and effect are eternally changing places. So that what is effect here and now will be cause there and then and vice versa. So cause and effect are constantly acting on each other. 
what is the cause here may become the effect there and what is the effect here may become the cause of the original cause even. And that is dialectics, how things impact each other. Dialectics, on the other hand, tries to comprehend things in their representations, ideas, in their essential connections, concatenations, motion, origin, and ending. And nature is the perfect proof of dialectics because nature does not move in the eternal oneness of a perpetually recurring cycle, but goes through a real historical evolution. It is constantly changing. It is also operating in a cycle, but in that cycle, it is constantly also moving forward. And that is, for example, where Darwin's evolution is so important because it gives the proof of the existence of dialectics in nature. Darwin, says Engels, dealt the metaphysical conception of nature the heaviest blow by his proof that all organic beings, plants, animals, and man himself are the products of a process of evolution going on through millions of years. And Immanuel Kant was also a dialectician. He resolved the stable and eternally durable solar system of Newton into the result of a historical process, the formation of the sun and all the planets out of a rotating nebulous mass. From this, he drew the conclusion that given this origin of the solar system, its future death followed of necessity. In other words, everybody up till the time of Newton thought that the stars were eternal, that they could not be born, they could not die. Because, I mean, if you look at the sky, you see the same stars year in and year out. For centuries, they do not change. So ancient man thought that stars existed from infinity and would continue to exist from, for infinity. But Immanuel Kant, though he didn't have scientific evidence at the time, pointed out that all of the celestial objects were made of the same matter that this earth is made of. And by extension of that logic, they also underwent the same kind of evolutionary process that we see in this world. Half a century later, his theory was established mathematically by Laplace. And half a century after that, the spectroscope proved the existence in space of such incandescent masses of gas in various stages of condensation. So Kant really came to the conclusion that the solar system was itself in the process of evolution, that all the stars were in the process of evolution through dialectical thinking rather than through empirical evidence. German dialectical philosophy, of course, had culminated in the Hegelian system, says Engels. In this system, the whole world, the natural world, the historical world, and the intellectual world is represented as a process. It is in constant motion. It is in change, it is in transformation, and it is in, in development. An attempt is made to trace out the internal connections that make up this continuous movement and development. So in other words, what Hegel has given us are the laws of change, of all kinds of change. The laws of historical change, the laws of change in our thought, and the laws of change in nature. These are the three major things that we are thinking about in the world, is it? are they not? We're thinking about changes in nature, we're thinking about changes in ourselves, we're thinking about human history, we're thinking about intellectual changes. So what if the one set of laws governed all of these different changes? That is such an incredible and incredibly ambitious idea one set of laws could govern all the different types of changes, intellectual, historical, and natural. Now, Hegel tried to show that history is not a wild world of senseless deeds of violence, all equally condemnable at the judgment seat of mature philosophic reason, which really was the point of view of the Enlightenment. History, Hegel says, is the process of evolution of man, just as we see the process of evolution in nature. Darwin shows the process of evolution in nature. Hegel is just as important as Darwin because he shows the process of evolution of man and shows that this process of evolution of man rests on the same principles as the evolution in nature. The task of the historian was to trace out the inner law running through all its apparently accidental phenomena. So when you look at history, you'll see a lot of different things happening. People are killing and dying and wars are going on, etc., etc. And in and when you look at these things at the beginning, they seem absolutely chaotic. They seem like there is no pattern. 
But Hegel has tried to show you that there is a pattern in history. History develops according to its own laws of evolution. And that is Hegel's greatest achievement to posit the idea that human history is not just random, but is itself in the process of evolution. Now, Hegel had many, many shortcomings as well. He could not solve the problem of the laws of history, says Engels. But his greatness is that he asked the right questions. He posited the idea that there must be laws of the evolution of human history. That is his greatness. Hegel, of course, was limited by the extent of his own knowledge and by the extent of the knowledge at his time. He was additionally limited in the view of Engels by his idealist view of history, which is uh, we will discuss in a later lecture. But Hegel considered that all of human history was really animated by a world spirit. So Engels and Marx come to the conclusion that Hegel's dialectics were a colossal miscarriage. But they were the last of its kind because he had given the central ideas that he had raised the central questions which later philosophers began to answer. You see, for Hegel, thoughts were not abstract pictures of actual things and processes. In fact, actual things and processes were realized pictures of the ideas that existed somewhere from eternity. In that sense, Hegel was very much uh, like Plato. And this was the internal and incurable contradiction in Hegel. History is a process of evolution, of course, but history cannot find its intellectual conclusion in the discovery of any so-called absolute truth, said Marx and Engels. The Hegelian system is the very essence of this absolute truth. Hegel, in fact, thought that he had arrived at the conclusion of the development of philosophy, that his ideas had uh, capped, finished, all philosophical discussion. And in fact, he thought that in the evolution of politics, the French Revolution had finished off all the possibility of the evolution of history itself. So philosophy and history, according to Hegel, had come to an end with the French Revolution and his own system of dialectics. But Engel says, a system of natural and historical knowledge embracing everything and final for all time is a contradiction to the fundamental law of dialectical reasoning. Because the fundamental law of dialectical reasoning is that everything changes. So can there be an absolute truth? Of course, man makes giant strides from age to age, but does not arrive at the final absolute truth. Man cannot arrive at the final absolute truth because the journey towards this absolute truth is infinite. It can never end. This contradiction led German philosophers back to materialism because they rejected Hegel on the foundation, or at least some of Hegel's disciples rejected their master's philosophy on the foundation, that Hegel cannot be the last word in philosophy because that would contradict the dialectical idea that things continue to develop infinitely, continue to evolve infinitely. So those who disagreed with Hegel on this particular issue became what are known as the left Hegelians. And they went back towards materialism. But this was a materialism permeated with Hegelian dialectics because this was a materialism searching for the laws of historical evolution. This really is what Engels refers to as modern materialism. Modern materialism embraces the more recent discoveries of natural science, nature, stars, Organic species, ideas, etc. all have their history, evolution, birth and death. This is so important. This is the fundamental idea behind dialectics. Everything has a history and everything that has a history, everything that evolves through history, evolves through that history through certain eminent laws. There are, of course, also recurrent cycles. But these cycles assume infinitely larger dimensions, says Engels. In other words, you can see cycles of history, but no cycle is an exact replica of a previous cycle. In fact, through these apparent cycles of history, history itself is moving forward. Now, unlike Hegel, Marx and Engels did not think that history had come to an end. They did not think that human thought had come to an end, but they did think that 
as philosophy was defined in their own period of time, that kind of inquiry, that kind of thinking did come to an end. And so they talk not about the death of history, not about the end of history, which they think can never come to an end, but they do talk about the death of philosophy. Engels writes, as soon as each special science is bound to make clear its position in the great totality of things and of our knowledge of things, a special science, that is philosophy, dealing with this totality is superfluous or unnecessary. What survives of philosophy is science of thought and its law, that is formal logic and dialectics. Everything else is subsumed in the positive science of nature and the science of history. In other words, you have seen this process come about uh, through the intellectual development in the academy. What, ha what has happened in the last couple of hundred years is that uh, if you go a couple of hundred years before, nearly every subject that you can think of today was subsumed in the larger subject of philosophy. Ma whether that was mathematics, whether that was physics, chemistry, biology, all of this was considered to be basically under one meta subject and that meta subject was philosophy. But now these subjects have emerged from philosophy, have stood on this on their own foundation, have stood on the scientific foundation and of course have determined how they relate to each other and so all that is left within philosophy which at one point in time embraced nearly everything, all that is left within philosophy is basically the theory of knowledge, in other words epistemology, logic and dialectics. So now in the time of Marx and Engels a new conception of history is being born. The old idealist conception of history, says Engels, knew nothing of class struggles based upon economic interests. It knew nothing of economic interests, production and all economic relations appeared in it only as incidental, subordinate elements in the history of civilization. In other words, when we examined history in the past, we looked at only the evolution of ideas and how they impacted the world. There was no attention paid at all to economics. There was no attention paid at all to production and how that impacted our ideas. But now we see new movements on the horizon. We see the first working class rising in 1831 in Lyons. We see the Chartist movement emerge from 1838 to 1842. This is the first national working class movement, working class party. The class struggle has undermined the old idealist view of history. Why? Because it has pushed forward the economic question. It has pushed forward the question of bread and butter. And it has pushed forward the idea that history is the history really of class struggles. The class struggle going on in the present is pushing forward the idea that warring classes of society are always the products of the modes of production and of exchange. In a word, of the economic conditions of their time. The economic structure of society is the real basis from which one can work out the ultimate explanation of the whole superstructure of philosophical, juridical, political, religious relations of any given historical period. This is the materialist conception of history to see how economics is impacting our politics, our culture, our ideas and our conceptions of, of freedom and liberty and the struggle for freedom and liberty. So now to sum up, the great contribution of Hegel was that he freed history from metaphysics. He made it dialectical. He made us understand that history is going through an evolutionary process. And he made us understand that the task of the historian or the scholar or the philosopher is to understand these laws of history. But his conception of history was essentially idealistic. Now idealism has been driven from its last refuge, that is the philosophy of history. Now a materialist treatment of history was propounded and a method found of explaining man's knowing by his being instead of as heretofore his being by his knowing. And this is the science of socialism. Socialism is not the accidental discovery of this or that ingenious brain. Of course, at one level it is. But there are many circumstances that give rise to the doctrine of socialism and to the discovery of socialism 
by an ingenious brain. It is the necessary, therefore, outcome of the struggle between two historically developed classes. On the one hand, the working class, the proletariat, and on the other hand, the capitalist, that is the bourgeoisie. It is not a utopia, but it is examining the real historical economic succession of events from which these classes and their antagonism had of necessity sprung and to discover in the economic conditions thus created the means of ending the conflict. In other words, it does not begin by any utopian conception of human nature or of society, of what it ought to be like or any categorical imperative at all. It always, modern socialism, scientific socialism, always begins by examining the actually existing class struggle in any given society. And that is the difference between utopian socialism and modern socialism. Utopian socialism could not explain capitalism. It did not fundamentally address itself to the problem of production in that way, in that materialist conception of history. And therefore, the socialism of earlier days certainly criticized the existing capitalist mode of production and also its consequences, how it created poverty and so on. But it could not explain them and therefore could not get the mastery of them. It could only simply reject them as bad. When I think of modern social media and the vast majority of people who write against capitalism today, that I think is also what I discover, that where is they reject capitalism if it is given to them that they should explain what capitalism is, how it functions, we find that many times their ideas are not really very clear. Socialism became a science with Karl Marx. Why? For two main reasons. First of all, because he gave the materialist conception of history. To present the capitalist mode of production, says Engels, in its historical connection and its inevitableness during a particular historical period and therefore also to present its inevitable downfall. This was the first great contribution by Karl Marx and also by Engels. And the second great contribution was the theory of surplus value to lay bare the essential character of the capitalist mode of produ production, which was still a secret. How is it that the capitalist is able to exploit the worker and why is it that the capitalist system will always be an exploitative system. So that ends my lecture for today. We will pursue these questions in the next lecture. I hope that you enjoyed um, this talk. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for your time.